There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hey guys, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. This is just a preface that I'm filming after the fact to put at the beginning of my Friday Reads video. Moments before I turned the video on, I found out that the Canadian Prime Minister's wife, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, had tested positive for coronavirus, and I was quite shaken up, and I don't think I said anything irresponsible in the comments that you're about to watch about the coronavirus pandemic spreading across the world, but I was in kind of a panicked state of mind, and... I don't know if I chose all of my words carefully, so I just wanted you to know that now that I'm editing the video, I'm not going to leave any of that out, but we all need to take a deep breath. I'm not going to take back anything I said. I think this is a huge, big, freaking deal for everybody everywhere, but I wish that I had waited for an hour or so before filming it so that you wouldn't be seeing me look and sound so panicked. I'm feeling kind of resigned, but opti optimistic, but yeah, I think it's going to be bad. It's going to get worse and worse before it starts to get better. Um, and I've since talked to my parents. They're winter holidaying in Victoria, British Columbia, and everything is shut down there. So they're thinking of going home to Saskatchewan early. They're both healthy at the, now, but I've been very worried about them. But... Before you watch what I'm about to say, take a deep breath and realize that now that I've had an hour to calm down, I still hold that the things that I expressed concern about are things that we should all be concerned about, but I regret that you are going to watch me as panic-stricken as I appear, as I was when I filmed it, all right? Hello, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I'm a little shaken up. Moments before I was set to press record, I found out that... The Canadian Prime Minister's wife has tested positive for coronavirus. This is shocking. I'd heard the news that she had become ill and they were waiting for test results and both she and her husband, Justin Trudeau, had self-isolated, but she actually has it. So, yeah, well, I think the worst case scenario is what's coming true and a supermarket employee, a 15-minute walk from where I work, was diagnosed. That supermarket was closed for several days but has now reopened. The closest hospital to where I live has four coronavirus patients, including one nurse. I think that we are all encountering many dozens of people every day that have it. Most of them are asymptomatic. The doctors don't seem to be sure whether asymptomatic people are contagious. I thought that had been clearly established several weeks ago that it didn't matter whether you were really ill, you could still pass it. But now today, they don't seem to be sure about that. So um, I think it's best to err on the side of caution, people. And I think probably I will have to stay home from work for a couple of weeks. I think that's where Japan's going. The biggest fallacy, as far as I can understand it, is that Japan and Canada and the U.S. don't have very many cases because the numbers are so low. Those three countries are idiot countries, Japan, Canada, and U.S., because they're not massively testing their population. The countries that are massively testing their population, Korea and Italy, have thousands and thousands of people. Well, so do all the other countries where it has shown up or it's going to be that high of a number and the testing is really important to do so no need to panic i personally am not worried i'm maybe young enough that if i get it i won't die <laughs> that's a cheery way to start my friday reads and i hope sophie gregoire trudeau is young enough and looks very healthy to me that she will probably be okay but the prime minister of canada probably has the virus and who has he met in the last few days the entire canadian cabinet has probably been exposed to it, just like Trump and all of his cabinet. I mean, that's the thing. The political leadership and the doctors and nurses at the hospitals are, are what happens when everybody's down and out. Yeah, it's a little scary. Personally not worried. Globally, what's happening and how so many countries are fumbling the response. Not that I know exactly what these countries should be doing, but testing is important. Korea has started to get theirs under control, and Italy has done some very radical things in terms of quarantining the whole country, but I think that's probably where 
it's going, people. So thank God for BookTube and books. Oh, okay. Well, I <laughs> that just literally was all set to press record, and then the New York Times headline came that she had tested positive. So, holy shit! I've had a really great reading week. I have bailed on two. I bailed on the audiobook of the Pat Conroy memoir, The Water is Wide, which was about his experience in the late 60s, I believe, of being a white teacher on an island off the coast of one of the Carolinas, and his experiences trying to instill some kind of love of learning in these neglected island peoples that were african-american and had been woefully neglected by previous teachers they just were given up on and i thought it kind of sucked it has has some historical value i guess but certain white attitudes towards non-white people however well-meaning that would have resonated in a progressive way through the culture of the day just don't age well and this one it just made me shudder there was recitation of all the racism of the white people that he worked with and that he had known in his life but that was given much more attention in the book and was really awful to read people were not as self-conscious as they are today about expressing how obnoxiously hideously racist white people are i don't think the attitudes have changed very much but the People don't say it out loud. And that was just disgusting to read. And also I thought it was disgusting that I wasn't really getting a sense of who these students were beyond how poorly they spoke English, the white male narrator imitating their accents. It just wasn't working for me. I, I No, nope, nope, nope. Uh, it doesn't put me off wanting to read Pat Conroy's fiction, which I've never read and I hear is wonderful, but this memoir should just be kind of kept, kept in the archives for historical value, but not for anything else. I couldn't stand it. I got almost halfway through. And sadly, I didn't get along with this novel that I was buddy reading with Ange from Beyond the Pages, The Deeper the Water, The Uglier the Fish by Katja Apakina. I got again almost halfway through, gave it an honest try. And it certainly started out in a very gripping way. It's the story of two adolescent children of a mentally ill mother who is being hospitalized after a suicide attempt. And they are living with their dad, who they had never really known. The animating issue of this novel is, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Like, was the father responsible for the mother's mental health issues or what or that everybody was crazy the father was seeming creepier and creepier as the book went on i don't mind fiction about creepy men but i didn't think any of the characters were well drawn enough i was expected to just follow the plot the mystery of who's the biggest creep of all or what's really happened back in the 1960s and which parent is the one that we should be feeling sorry for without sufficient character development and more and more characters being introduced all the time in bite-sized chapters in their own voice or through their emails or diary entries. I didn't mind that structure, but I didn't have enough of a characterological scaffolding that this story was taking me to a darker and darker place and I didn't feel the characters were sustaining it for me. So that equals genre fiction. No thank you. I bailed. So those were my bails. And I have finished three. I finally finished Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd. I absolutely loved it. Five stars. I read it over two months or more, which I think is the speed at which I should definitely read Hardy. I loved the characters. I loved how richly the characters were portrayed unlike the last one I just mentioned and how the sheep farming especially but the rural lives of these people and the things that they needed to do to live those lives and eke out a living were central to the way the plot unfolded that was masterful and there are scenes about sheep being at risk or agricultural crops being at risk from a storm and what the people had to do to try to save the animals or to save their crops that were as dramatic as anything I've ever read. I loved the fact that Bathsheba was a farmer in her own right 
There were other things about the way that the narrator of the novel made very sexist comments that would have been completely natural when this was written in about 1874, I think, that uh, were a bit jarring, but you, you expect that when you read Victorian literature. She was a really strong, independent character that had a very confusing love life. I don't think every one of... Thomas Hardy's sentences are well written. I find sometimes that he goes off in a Jamesian direction with needlessly complex turns of phrase. But when he is writing dialogue, humor, or writing the action scenes, just an incredibly fantastic writer. But sometimes when he's waxing philosophical it's like oh thomas you didn't need to leave that one in now there's a whole bunch of stuff and i have still haven't taken the time to you know there's hunt, dozens and dozens of pages of prefaces introductions and addendums appendices about the various versions of this novel and i have not bothered to look at those at all but frequently in the footnotes Differences between the text got explained. I originally started this as an audiobook text combo, but the audiobook was a different version than what I was reading, and that got too confusing after a while that when the changes were so big. So I abandoned the audiobook, even though the narration was excellent. This Penguin version, I'm just looking for the very first time at the introduction, the opening paragraph. It says, This is the very first publication of Hardy's own original words just as they left his pen, just as they appeared on his editor's desk, prior to alteration and serialization in the Cornhill magazine in 1874. So this was the director's cut. This is exactly how he wrote it. But then it was the publishers edited it. And most, I think, until this one was published around 1996 or 2000. Before that, the, the edition everybody else was reading was the edited version. This was unedited, and I, I loved it. I will be doing a full review of this, or I will attempt to. This was a difficult read, and I mean that in sort of an emotional way, but also as a reader. My Conversations with Canadians by Lee Maracle. These essays were not particularly well written. Uh, I learned partway in that she wrote them on her iPhone, and they kind of feel like that. Some of these could have been edited for clarity, but I still got so much out of it, and I will try to address some of that in a forthcoming review. Lee Markle is an Indigenous writer who lives in Canada. She would not call herself a Canadian, and after reading this book, I say to that, you go, girl! Very interesting. I want to read more by her, her fiction and other writings. And I will also be doing a full review of the royal biography that I buddy read with Leah. I just finished it yesterday. Olga Romanov, Russia's Last Grand Duchess by Patricia Phoenix. This was really great. Not perfect, but fascinating. Got my royal fix for a few months. I had hoped to finish more by now, but I didn't. But that's not too shabby, hey? I have started three new books. One on audio that this is March. This is the Irish Readathon month. Why, why is it? It's um, St. Patrick's Day sometime this month. So I forgot that I had bookmarked an audio book of an anthology of Irish short stories by women. The Long Gaze Back, an anthology of Irish women writers, edited by Sinead Gleason. And so I have started listening to that in the morning and the evening while I'm on my exercise bicycle. And it is fantastic. It's starting from the earliest women writers up to the present. I think there's about 30 stories in it. And they're great. The first one was by Maria Edgeworth, who I don't think I knew was Irish. And it was pretty good and just going through them day by day. But that's finally an audiobook success. Adam and I have started our buddy read of Lawrence Durrell's Justine, the first novel in his Alexandria Quartet, and it is so, I've been saying rich, Adam has been saying lush in our Voxer conversations, I think both of those words fit this book very aptly, it's knocking my socks off. The writing is just so gorgeous, and the story is indirectly told. You know what I'm going to do? I'm not even going to try to describe what it's about. I want to read you... I haven't asked Adam yet what he makes of the... There's a section, and I encountered this in another book recently. At the end, it's called Consequential Data. And it's not the footnotes, but it's got sections, characters, squeezes, and little excerpts. I don't know what it is or how to incorporate it in my reading. So, Adam, I will be asking you about that later. But 
One of the minor characters, I think so far he's a minor character in the novel, is his name is Purse Warden, and he is a novelist. And there is this excerpt in the consequential data that's attributed to this character, Purse Warden, on the N-dimensional novel trilogy. And I just thought it was fascinating, and it does really give you a sense of what I think Lawrence Durrell is up to here. So let me read it to you. The narrative momentum forward is countersprung by references backwards in time, giving the impression of a book which is not traveling from A to B, but standing above time and turning slowly on its own axis to comprehend the whole pattern. Things do not all lead forward to other things. Some lead backwards to things which have passed. A marriage of past and present with the flying multiplicity of the future racing towards one. Anyway, that was my idea. And that is what reading this novel so far is like. I've read about a third of it. And thankfully, Adam agreed with me that uh, with a novel this rich, this lush, we needed to slow down. So this is going to take us a, quite a bit longer than we had originally anticipated. And that is awesome. And yesterday I read the first chapter of Elizabeth Bowen's famous novel from the 1940s, I believe, The Last September. Oh no, this was written in 1929. I really enjoyed the first chapter, which was about 15 or 12 pages. It's about some guests arriving at this Irish nobleman's house, and we are seeing the story so far from the perspective of a young niece, and she seems to have some deep, mysterious connection to the male visitor. It seems to be of a romantic origin or romantic link but he's there with his wife and this young woman she's talking to her cousin who is also not a child i don't think he's a child of the people whose house they are having this conversation in so the relationships between the people are not clear but they're talking in kind of a library space the architecture of the house is fascinating because part of what is conveyed to the reader so deeply is that talking in this space their conversation is easily overheard by guests that could hear them through their doors or through their windows that overlook this library and so they're having to be very careful and they're talking about previous experiences where conversations that were assumed to be private between two people were heard by other people in the house and all hell broke loose and I just love the way that was described it's just like oh this house seems like it's going to be a character in the story starting out promisingly and I don't want to be too ambitious I do have one buddy read starting in the coming days on Monday Britta Fuller and I will be starting our buddy read of Nagar Javadi's Disoriental. This has been a booktube darling. It's an Iranian novel. The author lives in Paris, and I believe she wrote it in French, yes. And it's translated from the French by Tina Cover. And then if I finish, I, I expect to finish some other stuff up in the coming week, and so I will replace it with these books if things go well. The next on my Memento Moriathon reading list is Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses. And next up on the uh, My Husband Pulls Books Off My Shelf reading project for 2020 is The Drowner by Robert Drew. This is an Australian novel that none of my Australian booktube buddies have ever heard of. I bought it used here in Tokyo several years ago, and I did it in a try a chapter tag. I'll put the links to all that stuff below, including the Memento Moriathon video and whatever else is relevant to what I've been talking about but for the triad chapter the writing intrigued me but the synopsis of it is there is a bit of pagan magic so it depends on how it's treated in the novel if it's treated in kind of a woo-woo way where I have to agree that this is magic to enjoy this story I'm not going to get very far but part of the story happens in Wiltshire and then part of the story happens in Australia the father who presumably lived in Wiltshire, he was a practitioner of the ancient art of floating land. In other words, he was a drowner. And I don't know exactly what that means, but the first chapter of it was really, really good. So I'm going to finally give it a try. Woo! Thanks for watching. Everybody stay positive, stay safe. Don't go out. Don't talk to people face to face. Don't meet anybody. Just read and make videos. That's what the Center for Disease Control is saying. So you, we must obey. Gallows humor, anyone? Thanks for watching.